hello, everybody. I've just uh, received a notification to say that the uh, the broadcast is live. Um, apologies for being slightly later than the, we'd planned to start. And there was just some sort of technical hangups. In fact, we haven't quite been able to sort of fix the issue of being able to share the audio in a very particular kind of way. Um, we'd like it to have been embedded within your your um, your devices, but in fact. Um, the way it's going to have to work is that uh, you'll just be picking up the audio coming out of my laptop from my lapel mic that I've got on here. So the audio isn't quite as good as I'd like it to have been, but um, you know we'll sort of plow on. I think we'll um, we just get sucked into all sorts of horrible, you know, technical dead ends if we sort of carry on um, trying to fix the issue. So anyway, we'll we'll, we'll let's carry on as we are. Um, uh, first of all, I mean, I just want to say thank you, uh, you know, to uh, to Benita and to Jasmir uh, and the Psalm team for actually inviting me uh, to talk about the project. Uh, you know, we've been working on this for a while, and obviously, it's uh, it's a real pleasure for us to share 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 the share the you know the findings on this thing. We've been working for years now, and uh, it's it's endlessly fruitful. It seems to us. So, um, I've, we've got something like around forty to fifty minutes or so to sort of talk about the project, and we'll just go through a rough, uh, a rough schedule. We'll talk a little bit about the kind of work uh, that we do as Modus Arts um, and the background to the actual project itself. And then we're going to be sharing um, a set of four videos that we've um, that we've um, pulled out from the archive itself um, around the theme of home, um, which is, is something that we thought would sit really well with this year's theme at Psalm. And then there's scope for Q&As. Now, obviously, there isn't uh, people here. Um, uh, there's no sort of co-presence as such. So I can't see who's um, listening. I can't see who's, you know, uh, I can't see anybody there at all. So it's a bit of a, a blind audience for me. Um, but anyway, hopefully a Q&A, and hopefully I'll sort of face some interesting questions from you guys afterwards. Uh, so some, um, some background. Um, I'm a sound artist. Um, I sort of came from uh, music production, that was 20 odd years ago, I was a music maker and sort of released various albums and toured around the world, fortunately, sort of um, uh, playing this music, quite unusual music, uh, sort of part of the industrial noise scene. Um, and about 10 years ago, I stumbled on uh, Sonic Arts as a discipline and, uh, and created Modus Arts. And we specialise in, in, um, in all sort of Sonic related um, you know, uh, projects. So deep listening workshops for children over here, um, you know, um, multi-speaker sound installations, um, interdisciplinary collaborations, multi-speaker underground events, you know, uh, experimental instruments, that kind of thing. Right? Um, we uh, started work on the project, on the Tech project about five years ago. And fundamentally, this is the sort of the, the tag to it. It's on the, the use of cassette tapes uh, as, a, as a quite an unusual mode of long distance communication that was used by uh, British Pakistanis and other communities we've since found out. But uh, we, on this particular project, we're focusing on uh, British Pakistanis. And by that, I actually mean so far English Pakistanis uh, between 1960 to 1980s. Um, this is how the project came about, actually. Um, this is my father who died sadly about 20 odd years ago now. And um, he was. Um, you know, when he first came over to the UK from Pakistan in the, in the sort of early 60s or so, he brought with him this love for singing. He sang a devotional hymn called the Nut, and, and he was lovely. Uh, this. I mean, he loved, uh, he loved singing, and so he'd sing nuts, you know, at home all the time. We'd have people come around to our home all the time. Um, uh, you know, we wanted to, to hear him sing. We were taught how to sing these nuts ourselves when we were kids. You know, we were so rarely pulled into mosques to and various other sort of religious festivals to sing these nuts, you know. And um, and it got to the point where people were asking him to record these things on tapes just so that they could listen to him, you know, in the convenience of their own homes, right? So um, it was about five years ago. So when I went back to Manchester, I live in London now. I was originally born in Manchester. I went back to, um, to Manchester to look for one of these tapes. I knew we had some um, some copies in, of, uh, of his nuts. And I found them. I found, you know, uh, some of these not tapes. And it was incredible for me to revisit his voice. You know, it's not very often um, a person gets to listen to um, their parents' um, voice in this kind of way. But alongside, um, uh, in fact, let me, let, me, let me quickly just play you a little, a little uh, snippet from one of his not tapes, okay? just to give you an idea of the kind of um, what I mean by his voice. Yeah, 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 yeah. Promiscuity. 
तो मैं जरा पर एक चीज पेश करना इश्क और अकल उसके बाद चंद एक अशार पाना ग्राम तक पूरा हो जाए इश्क उठ आसी रचना रचांद इश्क उठ आसी रचना रचांद अकल आ फड़िया सूली चढ़ाद अकल आ फड़िया सूली चढ़ाद अकल का कर जमी इश्क कर फलक अकल चले भी की नूर वाली झलक इश्क दे फरमा बरदार मलक get the idea of, of the of the singing starts so alongside um this not tape i found um these other tapes and this this tape here to the left says do this a grelo mate that's in urdu right and and that isn't a not tape that isn't a music tape either i knew that this was actually uh, an audio message and in fact as soon as i had this thing in my hand I remember when I was a kid and in fact you know there's lots of um, um um typical memories of other people who remember this too of being pulled in to say hello you know to some auntie or uncle in Pakistan you know and um uh and I so I I remember you know these cassettes were not not tapes and I was pondering over what to do with them I understood that they were sort of fairly significant um as a kind of um as a sort of snapshot a historical snapshot of sorts but they weren't an arts project as such and i wasn't entirely sure how to really approach um um the project and how we would actually research the thing what i realized was actually that it was a heritage project um and so we approached the heritage fund who who have actually supported this project now for the last we did a pilot project in 2018 and then followed through the with a, a an England wide project in, throughout 19 and 20 uh and so through sort of uh, their support um you know we had to lay out some aims some objectives that we had and our first and foremost what we wanted to do was to collect as many cassettes as we possibly could we knew that they were extremely rare and most of these cassettes were you know in attics or whatever well for the most part actually just thrown away So we wanted one central place where these things could, would be held. We wanted to instigate dialogue specifically around heritage that we uh, understood to be captured on these cassette tapes, right? So we wanted to speak to uh, multiple generations about this given that, you know, I'm me as a second generation uh, British Pakistani who's born here. Um um I had some vague memory of these uh, of these recordings. certainly my you know my nieces nephews my my son for example have no idea about this stuff so intergenerational discourse was really important for us to sort of to try and uh, make sure that, that was well covered we wanted to frame the um the cassette tape itself as a form of comms that was parallel to um, to letter writing and in fact there's a lot of people you know we we since found out that part of the reason why uh, people were using this particular method of communication was simply because they couldn't read or write and we we'll, we we'll, uh, we'll get into that so it was a very useful form of comms uh we wanted to create um a range of outputs um you know we as artists were sort of familiar with putting on exhibitions and that's really you know it's relatively easy for us to do and been doing it for many many years uh, but what we wanted to do was to make sure that um that it wasn't just special interest groups that people who go to sort of exhibition spaces that were able to access this information so not just all really stories or or sound sort of nerds like me but actually you know uh, we fed this back to the community that actually supplied us with the raw information in the first instance right that meant 
making sure that the outputs were in multilingual and um, and uh, given that Patwari is the language that we found that's predominantly on these cassettes um, and the language that has been used in most of the households that we interviewed, we thought we'd present it in, in, in Patwari. The problem is Patwari is an oral only language. It has no written form. So that presented us with a whole lot of um, uh, problems and I'll, and I'll explain how we managed to sort of solve that. So we have the archive that exists. That's now at the Bishopsgate uh, Library here in London. Uh, we've managed to source 44 different cassettes and we've undertaken uh, 122 oral histories uh, so far. Um, an extraordinary array of themes have come out of this. So something that really we weren't prepared to, to uh, we had no idea actually about how complex this was going to get. Um, obvious things around migration and interesting aspects around technology, but things around gendered discrimination. You know, it seems that it was predominantly women who were using this um, for reasons I'll, I'll describe. Things around class and language that are fused together, you know. Um, you know, obviously partition stories that weren't directly on the cassettes themselves, but people have very strong memories about that. So we'll sort of talk about that too. Um, but yeah, something like about um, 50 separate themes that we've now uh, uncovered and sort of analyzed on the tapes. And on the back of all of that, we produced a whole range of outputs, like I mentioned to you before, it was really important for us to make sure that this was out in the public sphere. So um, we've created you know, like obviously like a website and whatever you, but we did, uh, you know, we put on physical exhibitions pre-lockdown. Uh, we had something like close to 21,000 visitors, which is extraordinary. Um, and we put on some online exhibitions and we have a poetry collection and we have a, a radio series and we have some learning resources for schools now. So that's being incorporated in the, in the, in the national curriculum for history. I mean, it's extraordinary. Really. There's no way we could have predicted it would have gone this, uh, this far, you know. So what I'll do is I'll um, I'll talk a little bit. I'll just share some of the the little sort of tidbits of uh, of what we found. Um, this is Halima Jabeen. This is my mum, and um, and she came to the UK about seven years after my dad did, and and I think it was sort of a fairly typical thing actually, where the men of a particular family arrived, um, expected to really just be in the UK for about three or four years. Uh, and then the idea was that they'd make enough money and go back to, you know, go back to India, go back to Pakistan, go back to Bangladesh, you know, where they came from. And um, and that isn't what happened, right, um, for many of them. And um, and whilst my mom was in Pakistan, while my dad was here in the UK, she was mistreated by her in-laws, actually, pretty badly. And when she did eventually come to the UK, they they sustained that mistreatment of her. They sent her horrible letters, you know, that were relayed to her. Um, and, and, it, and she was sort of, in one of our interviews with her, she mentioned that there was just essentially one day where she just went, I'm done with this. Like, enough's enough. Um, and because she couldn't read or write, um, and she couldn't read or write um, because she can go to school, and that, we're talking about primary school, and the reason why she didn't go to primary school because she's a girl. I mean, it's extraordinary really to think that whereas you know all of her brothers did do so um um so she recorded a reply on on a on a tape and had it vetted you know checked in with my dad said listen this is going to be a a pretty um a pokey response are you okay with this you know my dad listened to it and, and said yeah it's fine um she gave it to a relative of ours who's going to pakistan he found out what was on it and actually brought it back. He didn't hand it over. And um, and she was furious. She was absolutely furious with him. So she sent it in the post, you know, um, to make sure they they bloody got it. And, uh, and of course, you know, shit at the fan and it was all crazy. But it, it tells you that the cassettes were a vital lifeline. They, you know, in many instances, these were where women's voices were literally heard, you know. Um, in a very particular kind of way. So the cassettes were um, not all instances, of course, right? But in some instances, um, used in this way to sort of to to deal with inter complex interpersonal issues. These guys, um, they look fairly young. That's because they are young, according to me. Um, they are Asim here on the left on the side, and Asma on the right. Um, Asim. Um, was Bradford born, Asma is Badana born in Pakistan, in Gujarat. And 
they were a, it was an arranged marriage for these guys they were arranged to be married um, and every time they they sort of got on the phone to try and speak to each other they found that actually that it was really awkward they had no privacy and um and so Asim just came up with the idea of actually recording these messages for Asma on cassette tapes. And they essentially, um, you know, shared these cassette tapes between each other. They sent tapes to each other every three weeks for about three years and fell in love on the tapes. So you can see this slow sort of unfurling of love on the tapes that happened. And they've been um, extraordinarily gracious enough to give us three cassettes, you know, um, from their personal archives each and you can sort of imagine there's all sorts of really desperate yearning young love stuff on this you know so we've been extremely careful about what we what we do with the content of these tapes um, and that goes for all of the tapes you know we've taken a very sort of considered approach when it comes to um to sharing the information realizing these are intensely private mess you know messages not really intended for anybody uh, not for public ears right um the cassette tapes themselves, they were obviously developed uh, as a music media, right? They were made for um, multiple um, listens. The idea was you listen to some music, rewind, listen to it again. Um, and so we started teasing out these really interesting um, behaviors around cassette tape usage. So, you know, how people were recording things, how people were listening to them and um, teasing out these sort of little you know, nuances. And um, you can see with Celebrate here, um, she, you know, she said that she could only listen to cassette tapes once or twice because she'd get upset after listening to her mum cry, and you know, just unbearable for her. So you can imagine kind of what that must have felt like for her in that moment, listening to her mum saying, "Come back," you know, I can't bear to be, you know, without you. Um, coming here, most of the cassettes are missing. Of course, they're extremely rare because you know, um, kids of my generation. Um, you know, we'd find one of these tapes and we go, oh my God, this is like a free tape for us. We wouldn't record all of these invariably, you know, listen to, um, to music from the sort of 80s or whatever, which is seemingly really popular again now because of, uh, you know, Stranger Things and what have you. But uh, anyway, um, you know, we'd, we'd um, you know, we'd find a free tape. So a lot of them were just thrown away. They weren't really ascribed that much value to them. They were taken over by, you know, kids like ours. Um, lots of them were missing. And, you know, with Gummer here, you know, she had a message from her mom who, was dying from leukemia in Pakistan. And on this tape, she's asked for her to, you know, she's saying, Look, come back, see me before I die. And she she couldn't manage to do it. Um, but this tape is missing. And and, and there's a, a sort of a tape shaped hole that's missing in, in Gamma. She's looking for this tape, looking for her mom's voice and to this day can't find it. Um, sort of classic East is East stuff, isn't it? It's, look at this. Uh, this is my two brothers and my sister. Um, and of course, we're part of this story, right? We're, this generation that were born here are part of this story. And we sort of, you know, as I mentioned earlier on, we were pulled into, you know, to, to say, you know, hello to some auntie or uncle in, in Pakistan. And and there would be, you know, recordings of the environment that we're in, right? You know, for the most part, we just wanted to go out in the back alleys and sort of play football or cricket, one of you. Um, and so, um, and this thing about, you know, Sarah mentioned that we're talking about being asked to sing the national anthem, how important it was, obviously, for, for you know, for um, for our parents to sort of hang on to that uh, identity, Pakistani identity, and what it means to be Pakistani. We, of course, had no idea that Pakistan was actually part of India, right? That Bangladesh was part of Pakistan. I mean, all of these huge, um, you know, political realities. It was entirely, you know, we were entirely oblivious to to all of that. Um, so no idea about what the, what the national anthem of Pakistan really meant, you know, in any in any sense. Um, but nevertheless, been asked to sort of to sing it on the tapes, you know. Um, I mentioned to you obviously about literacy, and you know, um, Zarina says yeah, anyone who suddenly moves from one country to another feels alone, um, especially if they don't know the language. We sisters wanted to communicate, but we had problems writing letters. There was a lot of heartache within me uh, about not being able to read or write. So I mean, they still feel this this um, this injustice and this rage of not being able to. Read or write simply because it was a gendered decision, you know, by their extended, you know, by their families. We, of course, uncovered some extraordinary stories around migration. You know, um, migration stories are really complex. You know, they're not A to B. You know, um, they sometimes go from A to X to back to B and sh shift all over. You know, um, 
and um, and this is a photograph we had of uh, of the Pakistani side of Kashmir, and I've been to the Indian side of Kashmir a while ago. So I've travelled there for quite a bit, and this is it. Turns out that my family are from Srinagar, actually, on the Kashmir, um, on the Indian side of Kashmir. And about four or five generations ago, they sort of moved to um, to Gujarat, which is now in uh, in Pakistan. Um, and you know, and actually, to add to it, we can see here uh, with Samir talking about his parents, who are saying they're now back in Pakistan. My dad worked at Parcel Force as a manager for about forty years, and decided to retire to invest in properties. Now he has a rental income. And that was always his goal to go back to the village to live there. And we sort of hear about cases, you know, with um, Norwegian Pakistanis actually who do the same same kind of thing. They sort of go home and build these houses there, but they find that their families actually aren't, you know, Norwegian-born aren't particularly happy there anymore. And so there's these huge houses that are built there, um, and they're just empty, you know. Um, and so, um, yeah, interesting to sort of to see how um, Samir obviously who's natively born, didn't follow his parents, right? Um, interesting thing about partition, it's not something that we, we actually started out uh, with this in mind. Um, it, like, this is, this is a photograph of my, of my mum's um, village. So this is like a cluster of about seven, seven, literally seven houses in this very, very small rural village. Pakistan, and this is where the cassettes would actually go uh, when she was sending them to Pakistan. And um, sh she's the daughter of farmers that have a really pragmatic sort of um, relationship to life and death. Right? Animals are slaughtered for food. Right? We have a kind of slightly removed relationship to the food that we eat. Right? For them, it's really direct. And um, and when we talked about partition to her, her take on it was that it was worth it. The lives lost and the trauma that, it, that happened to India was worth it for having Pakistan, for Muslims to have their own sort of country, right? And, um, and I think it's something to do with that kind of, that for her, that pragmatic reality thing. It's not something I agree with. I, I don't quite understand it really myself. There were other people that we actually interviewed, and as soon as we touched on on partition, the interviews were over. We we just couldn't carry carry on. They were like, "I'm done. We're not we're not talking to you any further." And so we really understood that this is uh, different for different people for sure. Um, but uh, some people are still very much carrying the kind of horrors of of this all, and very much carrying the sort of traumas on a very daily basis. Uh, about you know about partition and um, so yeah it's it's been it's been um, very interesting for us I mean like my mom you know obviously she she she, she won't know anything about the Radcliffe line right she won't know anything about why the East India Company was sort of there for that long you know the Portuguese presence in India and all of that it, it, you know, she's not going to understand any of that but what she does remember though is the smell of villages burning around this village here during partition. And that's an extraordinary thing to unlock. You know, we didn't, we didn't really realize um, when, we, when we started this project, you know, that the, the real power and the value of oral history as a way of informing, you know, traditional ways of approaching history. Um, so that's a remarkable thing, the smell of it, right? The smell of it. Um, of course, one of the kind of really super interesting things for us was around language. You know, we um, I grew up believing that the language I was speaking was called Punjabi, but actually it was misnamed. The language itself that we spoke at home is Patwari. And as a, I think some people call it Bahari, and there's Patwari, Bahari, sort of, you know, social li linguists like to sort of deem it a certain, uh, a certain thing. Um, and you know, Aprizaban, right? I think it's commonly sort of used, right? Um, but the um, you know, what we found is that Patwari is uh, technically it's a language in its own right, right? It's not a dialect of Punjabi, it sort of sits between Punjabi and another language called Hindko. And, uh, and so that was really interesting, you know, understanding what that is and understanding how um, orality then plays on the way language 
uh, is expressed, but also kind of understanding the hierarchy of languages. And I think, you know, um, Urdu is being the sort of the, the lingua franca of Pakistan, you know, the, 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 the language of the sort of the educated class, right? Uh, the middle classes, whatever. And English, its presence there in, you know, in India and Pakistan, just simply because of kind of colonial, the British colonial presence there and how that's considered a much sort of higher language. And I speak Batwari, which is this sort of, you know, scummy street dialect, you know, thing. And so it was a really um, interesting to sort of to understand that this is technically a language in itself, and that kind of in some way, like it felt like I could I'd say this is slightly elevated. Um, but yeah, of course, it, it you know it um, it posed some um, some challenges for us in terms of how we would make that accessible. And the way we did that. Um, was to transliterate using Urdu, right? So if you can see here in this example, um, we, we, you know, we've got a time code of an interview that we did uh, with Mohammed Zareen. I undertook this particular interview. And, and in Urdu that says, Peli chize tusna na gave. And then he says, Marana Mohammed Zareen. Marana Mohammed Zareen. Peli chize. Now, my patois is a bit broken, I think, you know, um, it's a bit, a bit rubbish. But anyway, you can see how in, if you were to transliterate in English, it says, We've done exactly the same thing here using Urdu, right? Um, and then and then we have the translation. So you can see it's a really complex thing. It takes a, that's a lot of stuff, given the amount of, of information that we had. Um, let me just put this. Apologies for that notification there. Um, so there was uh, obviously a lot of data that we were that we were um, processing. So, um, you know, we, we were able to uh, transform all this information and then create a whole range of outputs. Right, the outputs what we mentioned to you, the archive itself. We were put on physical exhibitions. You know, um, we were able to. We made a, an incredible photo series with uh, Marin Wahid, who's an up and coming photographer, an extraordinary. Um, um, partnership with Suna Afshan, who's a Birmingham-based poet, and we essentially used poetry as a sort of method of trans uh, of translating the, uh, the you know, the, uh, um, the, uh, the patwari. Uh, a series of, of radio shows, so it's six uh, radio episodes that were broadcast on, on local radio, uh, radio stations throughout England, uh, a really fancy a WebXR based online exhibition where you know you can move as an autonomous avatar within these things, and there's a URL if you want to check it out. And uh, something that we're still developing right at the very tail end of this, we're working with Dan Linda Cohen and developing uh, a series of learning resources for teachers that can present uh, uh, some information around history, around um, partition, migration, all sort of essentially drawing from the Tech Matters archive itself. And we're pretty much ready to sort of go with that and hopefully. Fingers crossed, we'll have this rolled out into the national curriculum. That's our that's our intention. Right? Um, I mentioned to you that um, obviously we wanted to make sure that um, that um, the people that provided us with this information were able to access this stuff. So we did lots of private events as well. So this was for Gala Sangam in Bradford, and this is like a group of um, elderly Asian women or women's zone, uh, and we sort of did the talk for them and sort of relayed a lot of this stuff. You know. So what I'd like to do now is to present to you uh, with uh, the first of four videos. Um, and they're all sort of themed around uh, home. That was the that was the thing that we we, we tied on. Now, uh, obviously I can't share the audio and hopefully it'll come through fine, but um, uh, let's see how this goes. पता लगा कि मैं एक जेल भी जाई गई हूं क्योंकि इतना ऐसा ना कंट्री साइड गांव कराची खुला डुल्ला सारा माहौल तो इतना बहुत कुटन जी लगी मैं मैं एक गल भाई सपने ना कि डिफरेंस है कि उठा ना इतना ना डिफरेंस कितना सी उठो ऐसा ना मुल्क विच ना कश्मीर विच ये टेप है वो जल्दी रिकॉर्ड होई तो आई जी सी इथो जे जवाब सी ना को लेट जाना ना सी समझाई ने मतलब इथा नी मुसरूफ जिंदगी है ना ए बंदे कम आले सान कम करने से बाहर तार भी कम करने से मतलब उनको टाइम नहीं सी होना 
ਉੱਥਾਂ ਦੇ ਬੰਦੇ ਫਰਾਣੇ ਸਨ ਜਵਾਬ ਕੋ ਨਹੀਂ ਆਇਆ ਪਤਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਸਾਡੀ ਟੇਪ ਪੋਚੀ ਕੋਈ ਨਹੀਂ ਮਾਰੇ ਪਰ ਕੀ ਦਫਾ ਡਾਊਟ ਹੋਣੇ ਸਨ ਉਸ ਕੋ ਨੇ ਕੀਤੀ ਰੋਜ਼ ਵਿਚਾਰੇ ਡਾਕ ਨੂੰ ਪਤਾ ਕਰਨ ਦੇ ਜਾਣੇ ਸੀ ਡਾਕ ਕਸ਼ਮੀਰ ਸੇ ਸਨ ਡਾਕ ਖਾਨਾ ਸੀ ਉੱਥਾਂ ਪਤਾ ਕਰਨ ਜਾਣੇ ਸੀ ਫਿਰ ਕਦੇ ਕਦੇ ਅਸਨ ਮਤਲਬ ਸਾਡੇ ਘਰ ਚ ਵੀ ਪੁੱਛਣੇ ਆਣੇ ਸੀ ਕੋ ਨਹੀਂ ਆਇਆ ਕੋ ਨਹੀਂ ਰੀਲੀ ਆਈ ਤੇ ਕੋ ਨਹੀਂ ਆਈ ਮਤਲਬ ਇਹ ਕਿ ਉਥੋਂ ਜਲਦੀ ਆਈ ਜਿਹੜੀ ਸੀ ਇਥੋਂ ਦੇਰ ਨਾਲ ਜਵਾਬ ਪੁੱਛਣਾ ਸੀ ਨਹੀਂ ਕਿ ਸਮਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀ ਸ਼੍ਰੀ ਕਿ ਇਥੋਂ ਦੇਰੀ ਨਾਲ ਕੀ ਆ ਜਾਣਾ ਜਵਾਬ ਸਮਝ ਨਹੀਂ ਸੀ ਸ਼੍ਰੀ ਫਿਰ ਆਸਤੇ ਆਸਤੇ ਜਿਸ ਲਈ ਦਰੋ ਅਸਾਂ ਨੇ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਇੰਗਲੈਂਡ ਤੋਂ ਬੰਦੇ ਜਾਣੇ ਸਨ ਨਾ ਮਸਲਾ ਸਾਡੇ ਫੈਮਿਲੀ ਮੈਂਬਰਸ ਉਹ ਬਾਣੇ ਸਨ ਕਿ ਉੱਥਾਂ ਦੀ ਜ਼ਿੰਦਗੀ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਆ ਨਾ ਸਸੂਬਾ ਤਕੜਿਆ ਨਾ ਸ਼ਾਮ ਤਕੜਿਆ ਇੱਕ ਜਾਣਾ ਕੰਮੇ ਪਰ ਦੂਸਰਾ ਜਾਣਾ ਤੀਸਰਾ ਸਕਾ ਇੱਕ ਘਰ ਵਿੱਚ ਰਹਿਣੇ ਆ ਤਾਂ ਸਾਈ ਇੱਕ ਦੂਏ ਕੇ ਮਿਲਨੇ ਕੋ ਨਾ ਅਦੂ ਪਤਾ ਲੱਗਾ ਕਿ ਇਹਦੇ ਜਵਾਬ ਦੇਰੀ ਨਾ ਕੀ ਆ ਇਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ Oh, I love it. Um, I'm sort of noticing there's a bit of a lag between the, you know, uh, what you're able to hear and what you can see. And I think it's just to do with this kind of audio issue that we had before. So I hope it isn't too un- unsettling and too sort of dislocating. But uh, anyway, um, this is Sham Damon from Oldham. And he sort of uh, talks about um, um, languages, essentially, and the hierarchy of languages that I've mentioned to you before within the home. My name is Shams Rahman and today is 13th July. Uh, it's Monday, ਪਰ ਇੰਟਰਸਟਿੰਗ ਸਵਾਲ ਹੈ ਮੈਂ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇੱਥੇ ਨਵਾਂ ਆਇਆ ਸਾਂ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਮੈਂਟਲੀ ਆਪਣੀ ਜ਼ਬਾਨ ਤੋਂ ਬਹੁਤ ਦੂਰ ਹੋਇਆ ਸਾਂ ਯਾਨੀ ਕਿ ਘਰ ਮੈਂ ਸਟਿਲ ਆਪਣੀ ਜ਼ਬਾਨ ਬੋਲਦਾ ਸਾਂ ਲੇਕਿਨ ਲਿਟਰੇਚਰ ਦੀ ਜ਼ਬਾਨ ਜਾਂ ਯੂ نو ਐਸਪੀਰੇਸ਼ਨਸ ਐਂਬੀਸ਼ਨਸ ਉਹ ਉਰਦੂ ਸੀ ਠੀਕ ਹੈ ਤਾਂ ਉਹ ਇੱਕ ਬਤਰਾ ਨਾ ਸਿੰਬਲ ਵੀ ਆ ਸੀ ਵੀ ਪੜਿਆ ਲਿਖਿਆ ਬੰਦਾ ਜੀ ਜਾਂ ਉਰਦੂ ਬੋਲਾ ਤੇ ਇਥੇ ਅਸੀਂ ਤੇ ਮੈਂ ਆਫਟਰ ਮੀਟਿੰਗ ਸਮ ਪੀਪਲ ਆਈ ਰੀਅਲਾਈਜ਼ਡ ਕਿ ਐਕਚੁਅਲੀ ਮੈਂ ਵੀ ਆਪਣੀ ਜ਼ਬਾਨ ਦੀ ਸਮਝਣਾ ਵੀ ਲੋ ਜ਼ਬਾਨ ਹੈ ਪਰ ਐਮ ਪਰਨੀ ਜ਼ਬਾਨ ਹੈ ਤੇ ਅੱਗੇ ਵੀ ਜੇ ਵੀ ਅਸੀਂ ਬਾਕੀ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਬੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਕਮਿਊਨਿਟੀ ਹੈ ਉਹ ਵੀ ਇਹ ਸਮਝਣੇ ਤੇ then a friend of mine uh, he actually he, he told me he said look if you because initially when he initiated this kind of conversation i was not kind of uh, convinced i said no no he's he just exaggerating it's okay you know nobody bothers about who speaks what and he said okay if that is the case fir ek hi aake sirf asane bande pari puthwari bolne wale ਉਹ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਕੋਈ ਇੱਕ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਆਈ ਜਾਂ ਵੀ ਪਾਣੀ ਪੁੱਛਵਾੜੀ ਵਾਲੇ ਬੈਠੇ ਹੋਏ ਤਾਂ ਉਹ ਸਾਰੇ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਬੋਲਣ ਦੀ ਕੋਸ਼ਿਸ਼ ਕਰਨੇ ਉਹ ਇੱਕ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਕਦੇ ਨਹੀਂ ਟਰਾਈ ਕਰਨਾ ਵੀ ਮੈਂ ਆ ਬੋਲਾਂ ਹਾਂ ਪਾਣੀ ਪੁੱਛਵਾੜੀ ਵਾਈ ਇਜ਼ ਦੈਟ ਬੈਂ ਆਈ ਥਾਟ ਇਟ ਨਾ ਇਟ ਨਾ ਹੈਪਨ ਯੂ ਸੇ ਯੂ ਗੋ ਐਂਡ ਨਾਓ ਨੈਕਸਟ ਟਾਈਮ ਵੈਨ ਯੂ ਵੈਨ ਯੂ ਆਰ ਸਿਟਿੰਗ ਵਿਦ ਆਪਣੇ ਬੰਦੇ ਤਾਂ ਦੈਨ ਸੀ ਹੂ ਟਰਾਈਸ ਟੂ ਸਪੀਕ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਐਂਡ ਹੂ ਡਸ ਨਾ ਸਪੀਕ ਟਰਾਈ ਟੂ ਸਪੀਕ ਪਾਣੀ ਪੁੱਛਵਾੜੀ ਉਹ ਫਿਰ ਮੈਂ ਵਾਕਈ ਮੈਂ ਅਬਜ਼ਰਵ ਕੀਤਾ ਅੱਗੇ ਪਿਛਾਂ ਓਲਡੋ ਮੇਜ ਬਿਕਾ ਓਲਡੋ ਮੇਜ ਸਾਰੇ ਬੰਦੇ ਆ ਪੰਜਾਬੀ ਵੀ ਆ ਨਾ ਪਾਰੀ ਬੋਲਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਵੀ ਆ ਪਠਵਾਰੀ ਬੋਲਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਵੀ ਆ ਉਰਦੂ ਬੋਲਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਵੀ ਕੁਝ ਐਸ ਨੂੰ ਤੇ ਐਸ ਨੇ ਤੇਰੇ ਚਾਰ ਫੈਮਲੀ ਆ ਜਿਨ੍ਹਾਂ ਨੇ ਮਾਦਰੀ ਜ਼ਬਾਨ ਉਰਦੂ ਹੈ ਤੋ ਵੈਨ ਆਈ ਰੀਅਲਾਈਜ਼ ਯਾ ਇਜ਼ ਰਾਈਟ ਦੈਟਸ ਵਾਟ ਹੈਪਨਸ ਐਂਡ ਨਾ ਸਿਰਫ ਇਹ ਕਿ ਐਸ ਨੇ ਬੰਦੇ ਪਾਰੀ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਬੋਲਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਜਾਂ ਪਠਵਾਰੀ ਬੋਲਣ ਵਾਲੇ ਉਹ
and because their language does not work, that means internally we think we don't work. And I never ever thought these kind of thoughts before. <laughs> Oh, an extraordinary thing. Um, next clip is uh, Halima Jabin, my mom, and uh, and she sort of talks about um, about her experience of going to Pakistan and then coming back to the UK and speaking to family members there just before she came back to the UK. Alima first time at Ajbin Akar. Put her back, both you want to use some of the Pajas Alumberti. Both you want to, both you want to have a good opportunity. This is a good bar of coffee at Sakuza, a board of Pasalia, now it doesn't salabat. It was to pass all the old barge of the Salimata. Mesa Pasan Bapusalia to put to get a car. I'm there a car and I think they took it up. If anybody be telling you, they are in this is my home now, right? This is Abda Khan. I just remember people coming with uh, bags full of like neze, which are pine nuts. Um, neze and like rahmania, which are like dried apricots. And these all these little goodies from Pakistan, and then you'd have the um, tape as well. We went actually by road to Pakistan in the, in the mid seventies. I was five or six, and that was an adventure in itself. I still remember some some of the stuff from that, even though I was quite young. But whilst we were in Pakistan, um, the village at that time, my, my dad's village, didn't have any electricity. Um, they didn't have any like running water or any of that. So. Um, Entertainment was 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 not like we know it now. You know, now even the villages have televisions and they watch movies and they all have mobile phones even and stuff like that. But in those days, it would just be a case of, um, you know, they just sit and talk in the evenings. That was the that was the entertainment. So when we went over, me and my brother, my brother's uh, about four or five years older than me, uh, they'd get us to speak English. Now, they didn't understand any of it, the, the people in the village, like the relatives. They didn't understand a word we were saying, but they found it really entertaining. So me and my brother would just talk random things, rubbish, really, just like just talk in English. And they just get really happy. And then I think yeah. when we came back, um, I sometimes used to we speak in English into the tape as well, because it would, you know, because they'd say, oh, you know, get them to speak, say something in English. So I think that kind of carried on from when we were, we were in Pakistan for a little while. Um, just before we sort of wrap up, I just wanted to, um, um, I think, just sort of focus on, or at least relay how extraordinarily um, valuable it's been to understand oral history as a discipline, because it's unlocked all these incredible stories um, and understanding, you know, um, the significance of these relatively cheap bits of, you know, the, this cheap sort of audio system. Um, Karama Tikbal, who's uh, who's based in in, in Birmingham, he um, his father came over to 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 the UK with his uh, with Karama's sister, and then had to go back to Pakistan. So they sustained their relationship through these cassettes. And for Karama, you know, uh, his um, shaping of his of his dad was through the cassettes themselves, and. Um, you know, and he's sort of saying over the years, you know, he, he was able to you know, just listen to these cassettes. He was able to just switch them off when he when he just got irritated by, you know, by his dad. You know, I mean, I think that's probably every child's perfect dream, isn't it? Just be able to pause your, pause your parents. Um, but he sort of says, hey, you know, as a child, you may remember the imaginary friend, but my imaginary friend was my father. That's a that's an incredible um, um intensity like it's an extraordinary thing to sort of see see that bound to these cassettes and then being unlocked through this discipline oral history so yeah it's been a remarkable journey for us um i mean if you look at this um, the amount of people that were actually been working uh, behind it all and kind of explains why we were able to tease out all this extraordinary richness you know from these cassettes so it's a huge 
uh, endeavor with a lot of people behind it and there's actually a lot of um, support that we've had so extraordinarily grateful for that so um uh i think it's time to wrap it up it's a fairly what for me a fairly short sort of talk about it um uh feel free to sort of email me get in touch obviously we've got the website and the social media stuff and do all of that um I'd lovely to hear from you and obviously um it's always interesting for us to hear about you know people's stories their own stories around tape letter usage um so yeah if you want to get in touch with, uh, with me or the team feel free to thank you so much for your attention it's lovely um i'm just getting uh yeah sure isabel do you want to do you want to forward that um question or in fact do you want to sort of jump on um let me stop sharing this screen there we go um yeah, so it should be on the screen now. And Natasha saying it's such an incredible project with so many important themes. And how does it feel to create these stories and hidden histories? And what advice do you have for anyone wanting to do this in their own family or community? Uh, first of all, um, uh, do you want to mute your mic? Um, actually, just in case it's feeding through. There we go. Um, first and foremost, do it sooner rather than later, right? Um, there are there's at least three or four people that have actually uh, died uh, since we interviewed them. So we've relayed their, their oral histories to the families and they've been incredibly grateful. We just um, don't realise how important it is to capture these stories, especially from that kind of from that generation. Uh, my mum's in the, uh, she's 84 now, right? Um, we've interviewed some people 104 at the time. So first advice is to do this sooner rather than later. And it doesn't really matter whether you do this on really fancy equipment, which is we're really careful about that, making sure that we've got really, you know, the best equipment that we can do. So we capture the best audio and that, that we can then relay that, you know, a really good quality audio in, in all the different outputs, right? Do it on your phone if you need to. It doesn't really matter, right? Um, and there is a structure. There is a way of doing this thing. I mean, um, within oral history, it isn't just a case of a case of um, having a chat with somebody, and it isn't case of just a case of throwing a whole lot of questions at them either. It's somewhere in between these two spaces, um, and so it sort of make it as natural as possible, really. But it's certainly worth it. And aim for anything between thirty minutes to an hour is worth of of, a, of, an, of an interview. I would strongly recommend just interview anyone and everybody in your family, especially the elders. That's brilliant, thank you. And then uh, White Rock Entertainment has another question for you. He says, it's such a fantastic nostalgic talk. And after transcribing and collating, what are your next plans? What's the future? We, uh, we are now uh, working on a, a Tape Letters Scotland. That's just about to get off the ground, actually. So we're working closely with the, the Heritage Fund to try and get off the ground and working some, with some archives there. Uh, with the idea of of, um, of teasing out some stories from the Scottish Pakistani families around tape letter usage, and uh, and there's a there's an area in Glasgow called Pollock Shields, which apparently has a high uh, Pakistani uh, migrant community there. We're really keen on on, on looking, you know, looking into uh, whether there's any cassette tape usage, uh, cassette tapes there. We presume that usage is still there. Um, I can't wait to hear like Glaswegian, Patwari, the accents of that, you know, and they're kind of memories. There's some people that we've already spoken to and they're kind of fiercely Scottish, you know, but still have this Pakistani heritage, you know. Um, so there's that. Uh, we're also about to embark on a, on a three-year academic uh, AHRC-funded project uh, working uh, with Professor Will Gould from Leeds University and Professor Kate Parr from Manchester Met. And so we look at a whole bunch of academics looking at this in, in this through an academic lens. Uh, you know, remember, I'm an, I'm an artist, so um, it's it's for me the kind of first and foremost. I like to tra transform these stories into things that are engaging for the general public. You know, not necessarily specialised audiences. Um, yeah, so there's that, and uh, I think we might do a kind of smaller version of of like another England wide. But the plan is once we've done the tape letters Scotland, then look at tape letters Ireland, tape letters. Wales, and then have a, a sort of a UK-wide uh, view on uh, on this on this you know on this particular behaviour. 
I, I can't wait. I've just worked it up. I, I mean, obviously, I've spoken to, you know, a, a couple of Glaswegians and they have the really st strong Scottish accent, right? And, uh, um, well, I consider it to be a strong one and they obviously consider me to have a, a strong English one. Um, um, I, I haven't spoken to anybody in Petwari from Scotland yet. And so I'm, 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 uh, I'm here to find out. Uh, white rock, yeah, here we go. As an audio engineer, have you had to do a lot of cleanup of the sound or go with what you have? I, when it comes to the actual cassettes themselves, I've kept them exactly as they are. We've decided not to actually denoise any of these things because we thought that there's a um, authentic take on it. In fact, if you really get into sound territory, you can discern uh, different types of, of background noise, you know, actual white noise itself, and that kind of gives you a bit of a, a clue. So you become kind of uh, a bit more investigative, you know, um, like a kind of a sonic, it's, it's like a sonic archaeology of sorts, right? Um, and so uh, leaving things intact is really important, I think. Um, and uh, you go, like, I think denoising just, um, it changes the essence and the shape of it. So yeah, we don't have to near it. And obviously what we're trying to do is make sure that when it comes to the oral histories themselves, that we have like lovely equipment to do is, you know, really high end recordings, but the tapes themselves, we digitize them and then we just, uh, we don't touch the actual tapes themselves. We just, um, you know, we archive them straight away and just work from the digital files. It's only audio, actually. Um, I think there will be lots of ways of approaching this, you know, um, about migration. But for me, I remember, first and foremost, I'm, I'm a sound artist. And there's something about uh, the cassette tapes themselves um, that are fascinating to me. Um, they they capture the um, the language for first and foremost in a very particular kind of way, right? I mean, you know, the, the language is preserved in a, in a very particular kind of way. And I don't think you can do that with letters, for sure, for written letters, that is. Um, and given the kind of oral, you know, the oral nature of the, of the language, like I say, there's no way of preserving that. So the cassette itself, the medium itself, is kind of vital to the project. You know, um, there was a question of whether we look into airmail letters, whether we look into all sorts of other artifacts that sort of come alongside migration. And in fact, we rejected them. We chose not to do that. We even chose not to even look into quarter-inch tapes. There were people that were using quarter-inch reel-to-reel, -reel, domestic tapes, um, and they would take them on flights to Pakistan, you know, and bring them back, do recordings in Pakistan and bring them back. We decided not to even do that. So we thought we'd stick to... Uh, specifically to cassette tapes. Thank you. Thank you for the, you know, for the comments. Um, yeah, like I say, I mean, it's, it is lovely to share this thing. Uh, and it seems to be uh, endlessly fruitful. Um, there seems to be no end to what we're finding and no end to how we're able to then transform what we're finding into, into things that are sort of meaningful for, for people that have contributed to the thing. So yeah, we're, um, we feel honoured, properly honoured. Uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, I think, um, yes, I think so. I agree as well. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, Imran. Um, okay, so we, we'll, call, we'll wrap that up. Uh, you know, at this point. And uh, yeah, like I say, if anyone wants to get in touch, feel free to. Okay. Um, thanks for your attention. It's been lovely, you know, sharing the project and uh, bye for now.